Good morning. Greetings to you in the name of the Lord. It's great to see you all on this 12th Sunday after Pentecost and uh, want to welcome as well those of you who are joining us via, via the internet on YouTube or Facebook. Thank you for, for uh, looking in and hopefully we will see you here before very long. Um, if you would, please uh, sign the attendance register and pass that along, uh, along the pew. And while you're doing that, a couple of things, couple of things to mention. Uh, one is uh, just a reminder of members of the session. We meet this evening at 5.30 for shepherding and six o'clock for our regular meeting. Uh, the missions ministry team is meeting on Tuesday in the library. John, did I get the time right on that, 6.30? Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, and so uh, you can take a look at the other items that are, that are in the bulletin. A uh, couple of others that, that couldn't, hurt to, uh, couldn't hurt to mention uh, connected with our prayer concerns. One is uh, that uh, Katie Kirk is with us this morning, and we're we're glad of it. Uh, her wrists are not quite as flexible as they normally are, but <laughs> but she's she's doing okay. And the other is that George Chenoweth is back in town. Well, actually, he's in Jonesboro. He's at Jonesboro Rehab. Uh, he is in quarantine because 
Well, he spent time in the hospital and uh, we all know that the worst place for a sick person is the hospital. Uh, no telling what you might pick up there. So they have him uh, isolated for two weeks. No one can see him, including Mary Ann. Uh, however, you can call. Again, he's at Jonesboro Rehab. Uh, so do not hesitate to give him a call. Let him know you're thinking about him, praying for him. Uh, just see in general how he's, how he's feeling. And I know that given the lack of outside contact face-to-face uh, -face that he's going to have, that he will appreciate that very much. All right, I think that should be all for now. So let's worship the Lord.
Good morning. Please join me for the call to worship. Please stand and join me for the call to worship. So the call to worship this morning is from uh, Psalm uh, 119. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things of your law. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us together in this place today as your local church here. God, we thank you that as you have made your presence known to us this morning in a special way as we have gathered in your name, God, we thank you that you're doing that in churches all over the world. God, we just pray today that as we worship you, that our hearts would be engaged. God, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word also, that we may hold them in our hearts, that may, they may keep our hands and our, steep, and our feet steady in serving you, and we ask that in Christ's name, amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 75. It'll be behind me on the screen as well as your hymnal. Love divine, all loves excelling.
Good morning. Uh, let us pray. Lord, uh, we do thank you that we can come to you each and every day, each and uh, day or night, any moment that we can come and bring our concerns to you and give our praises to you. And Lord, today we ask uh, your blessing on each individual here this morning and each individual family this morning. Bless their hearts and give them confidence in walking in your ways as we, we need them each and every day, Lord. And uh, I just thank you that uh, you give us confidence to come and go as we do. Uh, Lord, we, we th do thank you for the so many answered prayers that you uh, bestow upon us as we you know our heart's concerns. And uh, we do thank you for the for um, uh, Robbie Rawls' improvement that he's home now. And uh, uh, we're thank thankful for that. And uh, just bless him, help him to continually get better. And we pray, thank you for baby Rowan as he's gone through mighty steps in his young life and uh, you've watching over he and his family and just keep your eye on them lord and uh, and bless that family as they go forward and we th we're thankful for corrective surgery as miss katie's gone through the, this week and uh, back with us this morning and uh, heal her quickly lord and uh, we thank you for george that he's been able to have some corrective surgery uh, help him to heal at the care facility over in Jonesboro. I'll be with he and uh, Mary Ann as they go through this time of, uh, of testing. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for also for Steve has water now. Steve Schnell, he has running water now. Lord, we thank you for that. And uh, uh, we're just so thankful that he has that and uh, help us be appreciative of what we do have each and every day. That's a blessing that we take for granted. Uh, I do pray for Miss Katie this morning, uh, Katie Horn, that she's had some, was having some pains in her back as she went through a procedure this week, just help her to get over that well and be with her this morning. Um, Lord, we thank you for Graydon that he's improving uh, with his eye condition and just watch over he and his family that he gets the right care that he needs his well, it's my wife, Terry. She's had some eye condition come up this last couple of days, help her and, and receive the care that she needs as, uh, as we go through that process herself. Lord, uh, I do thank you uh, and ask your, your blessings on Alice Edelman and Norman and Jesse Hickam and Low Verbal and uh, just be with her friends that aren't here that we, we think about. Uh, we, we lift them up to you, uh, Don Burnett and his family, Lord. Thank you that uh, uh, we, we have these friends that are not with us, but they're not forgotten. And uh, Lord, I do lift up our uh, first responders uh, that are very busy this time of year with a lot of things going on, uh, our police and our ambulance uh, service workers, uh, those that work in our healthcare facilities, Lord, they're you, when you think things were going to get better and easy, it seems like it, it's coming back upon us again. We just give them the patience and help them to have the uh, desire to help others as they, they've taken their training. But on Lord, even though it's not easy for them, uh, Lord, I pray for our schools as they open this week and uh, as last week and this week as uh, as the school bus drivers prepare, the cooks, the counselors, administrators, custodians, uh, the, the computer programmers, uh, and the, the parents and the teachers. Lord, just uh, help this be a harmonious time uh, for the families that are going through these and uh, just be with them, Lord, grant them safety and help them to learn what they need to, to help them or students to uh, be better citizens uh, to serve you. Uh, Lord, I pray for Christian families abroad that uh, help them. Uh, we, we, as we've learned over the last few weeks, Lord, uh, how we're blessed we are to live in what country we do. Uh, Lord, I pray for Pastor David this morning as he preaches his, your word to us and uh, may it register in our hearts and our minds that we'll be uh, servants for you better made as we walk out these doors. Yeah. 
Lord, I lift up the prayer that you taught us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom and a power and a glory forever. Amen. Our daily bread is but just one of the ways that our Lord blesses us daily, most, most of all through the gift of his son. We have an opportunity now to say thank you for the ways that he has blessed us. May we do so through the presentation of our tithes and offerings. Yeah, we're a little noisy, so probably a little rusty and things like that. So it's like I told John earlier this morning, I said, either we're here to sing today or we're part of your wait staff and we'll be taking drink orders. In a few minutes, so. But we've got a song. We've got a song that we worked on. You've heard it before, but it's, uh, it's almost like we're the full gospel hour here this morning. Just a little talk with Jesus. I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love, and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles, Hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Sometimes my path seems drear, without a ray of cheer, and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day. The mist of sin may rise and hide my starry skies, but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning, you will find a little Talk with Jesus makes it right. I may have doubts and fears, my eyes be filled with tears, but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care, and just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus, let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry, and he will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in, and you know a little fire is burning, Find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. When you feel a little prayer will turn in. And you know a little fire is burning. You will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Mm-hmm. 
Let us pray. Gracious Father, for the, all the good gifts that you bestow on us, despite our sin, despite our rebellion, nevertheless, you still love us, and you've given us everything, including your Son. We ask now that you would use these gifts in his name to spread his gospel. Use them and use us to carry your word throughout Anna and Southern Illinois and even to the ends of the earth, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The lesson is from 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 12. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand as you're able for our second hymn, number 529, O Perfect Love, All Human Thought. Titans earthly sorrow 
The gospel comes to us this morning from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and forever whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So where do you start with a subject like this? Well, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> we're gonna start in kind of a weird place. This is uh, from the 1930s, 1930 movie, Animal Crackers, starring the Marx Brothers. Uh, it is the source of uh, my wife shaking her head right now. Uh, cannot believe I'm doing this. It is the source of the immortal song, Hello, I Must Be Going. It is also the source of the well-known joke, this morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I'll never know. Wait, 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 wait. I wasn't done yet. (laughs) It is also... It is also uh, the the, uh, uh, source of another classic line in this scene, which is, as it happens, about marriage. Okay. But Captain, which one of us? Both of you, let's all get married. Back back up, there's no way to know what you're talking about. Back it up to, to 258. You have to hear the first line. Well, what do you say, girls? What do you say, will you marry me? But, Captain, which one of us? Both of you, let's all get married. This is my party. 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 Here I am talking to parties. I came down here for a party. What happens? Nothing. Not even ice cream. The gods look down and laugh. This would be a better world for children if the parents had to eat the spinach. Well, what do you say, girls? What do you say? Uh, are we all going to get married? All of us? All of us. But that's big of me. Yes, and that's big of me, too. It's big of all of us. Let's be big for a change. I'm sick of these conventional marriages. One woman and one man was good enough for your grandmother, but who wants to marry your grandmother? Nobody. Not even your grandfather. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, old movie. Sound not so great. I assume that you all would be rolling on the floor if you understood everything that Groucho said. Uh, The fact is that that comedians have been making jokes about marriage, husbands, wives, their relationship or relationships, uh, infidelity, and a variety of of other things for probably as long as there have been human beings, certainly in the last 190 years, last 90 years since uh, since Groucho had that scene about about marrying two women, uh, you've heard more than your fair share of jokes about that. And I've made those jokes too, right? Yes. (laughs) I've made those jokes, you've made those jokes. But this is serious. This is a serious matter. Let me give you a a very brief snapshot of the state of 
marriage in America, as of 2018, the divorce rate for first marriages was 42%. For second marriages, it was 60%. For third marriages, it was 73%. And by the time you get to the fourth one, nobody's even bothering. They're just living together. Oh, yes, 8.1% of all couple households involve cohabitation. Back when I was born, and even later, that figure was essentially zero. Only 50% of all children live with both of their biological parents through their high school years. Statistics about adultery are notoriously unreliable, but if you take them in their aggregate with all the variations in them, it looks like at least 30%, maybe more, but at least 30% of all married people cheat on their spouses at least once. Sadly, numbers among Christians are not significantly different. Christians are very much a mirror of the culture in that regard. And all of this points, along with the availability of no-fault divorce and the rise of cohabitation, uh, that 8.1 figure is in a way misleading. Uh, among those between the ages of 18 and 44, uh, about 60% cohabit at one point or another. Uh, only 50% of them ever get married. All of this points to an institution in trouble, in large part because we have forgotten how seriously God takes marriage. I love Groucho Marx to death. I think he may be the funniest man who ever lived. And yet I have to say, he and countless others like him have contributed to a mindset, at least in this country, if not in much of the, of the, of the developed world, that doesn't take marriage seriously. Jesus takes it seriously. This is the second uh, example of righteous living that he gives us in the Sermon on the Mount last week had to do with, uh, with anger and reconciliation. Um, this week, adultery, lust, divorce. Not exactly light subjects. He begins with the seventh commandment. We all know that, right? There's really no question about that. Last week, there was question, well, is that kill or murder? Uh, adultery is another story. Thou shalt not commit adultery, or you shall not commit adultery. Now, the fact that marital infidelity is one of the Ten Commandments, or fidelity, not infidelity, fidelity is one of the Ten Commandments, is already an indication of how seriously God takes marriage. Think about it. He, he talks about, about property. He talks about life. He talks about the holiness of his own name. He talks about relationships with parents, and he talks about marriage. Marriage is not just an issue uh, of secondary significance. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. But Jesus only mentions the commandment in order to take it to a deeper level. For Jesus, it's not just a matter of physical sexuality. That's bad, yes. I mean, there's no question that, 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 uh, that uh, adulterous relationships uh, are wrong. But Jesus wants to go to the heart of the matter, which is not found in the sexual act, but what comes before it. And so he says in verse 28, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I think I've referred before to the 1976 Playboy interview that uh, presidential candidate Jimmy Carter did, and the howls of laughter 
that he provoked uh, with, with the portion of the interview that referred to this passage. Uh, the, the expression lust in your heart became fodder for late night comedians for months, years after that, okay? Uh, well, <laughs> if it was funny when Jimmy Carter said it, it was also funny when Jesus said it. Jimmy Carter didn't come up with that. Jesus looks into the heart and he identifies the problem not simply as the actions that follow from it, but the state of the heart. It's the sin that begins in the heart, the sexual desiring of another person. Let's be clear about this. Lust is the not the same thing as looking at someone. Just because I look at a woman on the street or on television or in the grocery store doesn't mean that I automatically lust after her, right? This is, this is not something that it's just a matter of where, do your, where are your eyeballs focused. This is a matter of how do you respond when you see that? When you see that image, when you see that person, how do you respond? And um, what Jesus is saying is that to look at someone other than your spouse, because this is a spouse, this isn't just, this isn't just for men, okay? Women do this as well to look at someone other than your spouse with the intention of seeking sexual excitement as an expression of an infidelity that already has happened in the heart, even if nothing in the world outside of yourself ever happens, okay? So it is not just about action that you take in response to that initial prompting. It is about the initial prompting, which, by the way, is not the same as temptation. We need to be clear about that too, all right? If someone, let, let's, let, let's come up with something ridiculous here, okay? If someone puts in front of me the, uh, the Playboy magazine that Jimmy Carter's interview was in, because of course I, you know, I always read Playboy for the interviews, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad someone appreciated that. Yes. Um, let's, and that's, <clears throat> we all know. <laughs> okay. If I look at, at the, not at the interviews, but I look at the pictures and the pictures do nothing for me. I look at them and I think, I don't know how people can do this, compose like this, can put themselves on display, sell themselves like this. All it produces in, in me is, is revulsion. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's temptation, okay? A temptation to lust has been put in front of me, but I don't give in. As a matter of fact, it has the opposite effect. Well, if that's the case, everything's good. But on the other hand, if looking at those same pictures causes us then to fantasize about what life would be like even life that only lasted about 15 minutes or 30 minutes with, with this person on the page, as opposed to my spouse, then you're talking about what Jesus is talking about. The point here is that Jesus is saying that there is a mutual reinforcement between the heart and the organs that the heart speaks to that the heart controls and that what we need to do instead of giving into that is to control the heart. 
is to be sure that the heart does not uh, stray. <clears throat> unfortunately, unfortunately, and this is the reason I think why he deals with adultery at all is because adultery then leads to divorce. And here's where things get tricky because there are divorced people in this congregation. There are divorced people in almost every congregation. And the result is that this is a passage that most preachers won't get within 10 feet of because they don't want to offend anyone. So I'm going to start by apologizing in advance if I offend you with anything that I say about this. If I do, please tell me and we'll talk about it. But I'm not here to offend anyone. What I'm here to do is simply lay out what our Lord has said to us. Jesus makes very clear, divorce is not God's plan for his creation. When Adam and Eve were joined together, that was meant to be permanent. And in the law, it was meant to be permanent. Unfortunately, in Jesus's day, the Mosaic law had been perverted to be primarily about a legalistic process in the same way that unfortunately, the matter of divorce has become basically a legalistic process in our day. Anyone who's ever, been, ever had to deal with a family court situation in which divorce is part of the issue knows that, uh, that the process is the punishment. And you don't ever want to do that if you don't have to, but unfortunately a lot of people do. And they discover that we have turned, we have turned marriage into nothing more than a contract. Deuteronomy 24 verses one through four states this, and this is part of the law and unfortunately built upon the backs of this passage was a legalism that was, that, that was uh, having, having the effect of undermining marriage in Jesus's day. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, the word indecency, translated indecency there is is not as specific as adultery, uh, and in fact, is a little vague, truth be told. Uh, it probably refers to sexuality in some form or another, but not necessarily to something that, uh, that she's done. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. You all get that? No, and that's, and that's the kind of thing, quite frankly, that uh, you might've expected out of Congress or the state legislature, um, which is not to say that it is not inspired scripture, but it's to say, it's law, it's law, and law can be really complicated. Essentially what it's talking about is a husband and wife who split, split the wife remarries, the second husband divorces her, she can't go back to the first, okay? Because that would be wrong of him. Well, as it turned out over the centuries as rabbinic teaching about this developed, they focused on the certificate, not on the marriages, not on the divorce itself, but on the certificate. They didn't focus on the indecency involved. They focused on the piece of paper. Has anybody here 
ever heard the line, well, marriage is just about a piece of paper. Who says there's anything new under the sun? They focused on the piece of paper and they therefore held that divorce was permitted for virtually any reason as long as the proper certificate was provided, okay? As long as you had your I's dotted and T's crossed, or whatever the Hebrew alphabet equivalent of that would be, um, then you could, you could divorce your wife. And indecency, which is meant to refer to some kind of sexual misconduct, but not necessarily adultery, was essentially inflated to include anything you didn't like about your wife. The, uh, the old joke when we discussed this in seminary, and this is something that's been heard in Old Testament classes since God was young, uh, is that uh, this, is, this is about what happens when your wife burns the toast, okay? Your wife burns the toast, you give her a certificate of divorce because she's a lousy cook and, and you send her on her way. I'm not sure it'd be quite that bad, but <laughs> and we have spouses turning to one another saying, you can't really do that, can you? <laughs> God's view is different. God's view is very different. In Malachi chapter two, the prophet writes, I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. And I hate a man's covering himself with violence as well as with his garment. The suggestion being that violence, that divorce is almost a kind of violence against one's spouse. All right. Jesus's response is to restore the commandment on divorce back to its original purpose. He doesn't mention the certificate. Quite frankly, he doesn't care, I'm sure. He doesn't care about whether your papers are in order. He doesn't care whether, care whether the, all the legalisms have been, have been uh, properly observed. He says very simply, divorce that isn't for the cause of sexual immorality defined specifically as adultery means that a violation of the seventh commandment has taken place. And furthermore, that anyone who marries a divorced person in which the marriage was dissolved for a reason other than that, themselves commit adultery. Now, many people have felt that this directive is way too harsh, okay? That there may be times when things other than adultery should be taken into account in dissolving a marriage. But you need to understand this. This is not meant to be a burden. This is not meant to force people to stay together. This is meant as a spur to fix broken relationships. That's what this is about. As far as Jesus is concerned, the only reason to divorce being adultery is because in the beginning, when marriage was created in the joining together of Adam and Eve, it was said that they were one flesh. Well, if they were one flesh and adultery has intervened, they've been broken apart. Other, other faults that one spouse may commit against the other, other sins that one spouse may uh, commit against another are not necessarily going to be those that break that bond, okay? That break that bond uh, in the flesh as well as in the spirit. But what he's getting at here is Fix what's broken. Don't toss it aside. That's, that's, what, that's what marriage has become uh, in, in 21st century America. It, it's something disposable. You know what the average, not the average, the median, the median length 
of marriages in the United States is seven years. That's only a little longer than most people keep their cars. Marriage is considered a consumable. You do it for a while, eventually you get on one another's nerves and you walk away. Of course, we all know it's not nearly that easy, but that's the mindset. That's the mindset that permeates our culture. If you're not happy, leave. If you're not happy, leave. And if your washing machine breaks, don't call a repairman, get a new one. If your car breaks down, don't get it repaired, get a new one. If your child breaks down, get a new one. If your spouse breaks down, get a new one. That's the mindset. And that's what Jesus is combating here. The idea that our marriages are consumable. Instead, he's saying, deal with it. Do the hard work, the sacrificial work, the painful work of trying to repair a broken relationship. I know virtually no one who was, who was desperately unhappy the day they got married. Okay? People don't go into marriages thinking, I can't wait to get away from this person. Maybe some of them should, I don't know. I've met a few of those. But people don't go into marriages thinking, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to try this out for seven years. We're going to kick the tires. And if not, we'll go our own way. If you're going to do that, cohabit. That's not right either. But that's, the, again, the mindset that people take. But getting into marriage, uh, that's another story. Jesus's response is, if it can be fixed, fix it. And that's what he means by the heart of this passage. The heart of this passage is not about adultery. It's not about lust. And it's not even about divorce. It's verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Jesus's intention is that neither divorce nor cause of it in, in adultery should take place. So serious is he that that should be the case, that he urges his followers to give up whatever they need to rather than fall into it. Uh, the right eye and the right hand that he mentions in, in verses 29 and 30 were considered a person's most important assets. Okay. Not the brain, not even the heart. The most important assets that a person had for dealing with the, with the world uh, were the right hand and the right eye. The right eye represented one's best faculties, whereas the right hand represented one's best skills. Now, he doesn't mean this literally, of course. He is not saying... You know, if, if, if you're having a hard time with your right hand, just cut it off. Katie, don't do it. Don't, yeah, don't, don't do it. You, you will have a use for them later on. What? You're halfway there? <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't mean this to be taken literally. But what he means instead is to first express just how seriously he takes this matter. And second, to say, there's no sacrifice that's too great. There's no sacrifice that's too great to avoid falling into the kind of sin that he's talking about here, All right? Um, that does not mean, that does not mean that absolutely any marriage where adultery has not taken place can therefore be fixed or can therefore be saved. Sad to say, we do live in a fallen world and there are going to be times when it's just not possible. 
But among Christians, the call is to not give up anything like that easily. There have been folks that I have done marriage counseling with over the years, and it was obvious. It was obvious from the first 10 minutes of the first session, these people are not going to make it. I'm going to try with everything I've got. These people are not going to make it. They don't want to. And part of the reason why I would conclude that is because I would see that they weren't willing to give up in order to fix their relationship. When I say give up, I mean, they weren't able, they were, they were unwilling to swallow their pride. They were unwilling to admit that they were ever wrong. They were incapable of understanding the other person's perspective. They denied that they ever did anything that might have caused a reasonable other person to think that they'd harmed someone. They refused to give up anything of consequence, including their own emotional security in order to fix that relationship. What our Lord is telling his people here is your emotional security, your pride, your defensiveness, your conviction that you're right, none of those things are worth walking away from a marriage that otherwise can be saved. Because when you do that, when you do that, you essentially tell the world God's design for marriage matters less to me than my own needs and desires and ego. And when you send that message, you also send the message God doesn't matter as much as my needs and desires and ego, okay? So when Jesus tells us in response to, to lust or to adultery or to the, the impulse to divorce, he tells us, cut, cut out your right eye, cut, out, cut off your right uh, hand, uh, He's telling us, essentially, do what you need to do, whatever you need to do, in order to make things right. There are people who aren't capable of that. They're not capable of that. They'll never be capable of that. And those are people who are going to walk away. And in the process, they're going to toss their witness for Christ as well as their spouse, whether they realize it or not. What we are called to do instead is to do exactly what our Lord did for us. Crucify, kill, sacrifice whatever it is in us that is hardened to the hurts of another, of our spouse, and say, I will give this up. I will give up my pride. I will give up my defenses. I will admit to wrong, no matter how hard it is, in order that we might stay together. And in the process, in the process, we will not only save a marriage, but we will save a witness you all will remember that Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, likens the relationship between the husband and the wife to the relationship between Christ and his church. Well, guess what? We've not always been faithful to him, and yet he will not divorce us. That's why this is in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's pray. Gracious Father, marriages are under stresses and strains today, the likes of which 
people in the first century probably couldn't have conceived of. But stresses and strains, hurts and sins, those have been with us for far longer than just the last 2,000 years. There are times when we don't know how to save a damaged marriage. There are times when all the counseling in the world doesn't seem to make any difference. But we know that you can change hearts. And we know that you can fix what we have broken. And so for any here or any in our, our internet audience or any people anywhere who hear this, we ask that you would work on their hearts to fix what is broken. And where and where relationships have been irreparably broken, that you would heal the hearts of those who have been wounded, that they might be able to move beyond and live new lives that glorify you. At the same time, Father, we thank you for those marriages that despite the stresses and the strains have stayed together, have continued to work, have witnessed to you, to your grace, to your sacrifice, and to the connection, the unbreakable connection between Christ and his church. We thank you for those. Uh, there are many of them here, and we say hallelujah to those who continue to hold high the cross, not only over their own hearts, but over their homes. Hold it high where all can see. Thank you for them, Father. Go with them and continue to bless them and strengthen them in those right relationships today and always. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn, number 531, Happy the Home Where God is There. to
as you depart, receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of all grace who has made us for one another and brought us together that those bonds might never be broken. Be with us, at work in us, seen through us, both now and forever. Amen.